In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk about something that annoys probably everybody that works out in the gym. All of us have that one body part that, for whatever reason, just is stubborn. Like everybody, every other body part responds and reacts and we work out and they change. And there's that one body part that just is so stuck, just doesn't listen to anything that you tell it. It's like an annoying teenager. Well, in this episode, we actually give you the solution for stubborn body parts. You don't have to have a body part that doesn't respond. Believe it or not, we have worked with many, many clients on fixing this issue and actually turning a stubborn body part into a strong body part. Now, there's four key components that we're going to cover in this episode. The first one has to do with poor connection. Then we talk about ranges of motion. Then we talk about lack of prioritization. And then finally, bad programming. And don't worry, we give you the solutions. Now, in this episode, we do talk a lot about priming and how that can contribute to getting stubborn body parts to finally respond. Now, if you're confused by the word priming or you don't know how to really assess your body to figure out how to prime your body properly, if you go to mapsprimewebinar.com, we're actually going to be giving a free priming class. Justin is teaching the class. He's going to teach you how to do a self-assessment so you can assess your own body, figure out where your movement issues are, and he's going to show you movements that will benefit you on priming your body so you can bring up those weak, stubborn body parts. Now, the classes, when they're being uh, uh, put out there live, we're all going to be on there answering questions, so we'll be on there active. So if you ask us questions, we'll be right there. But if you miss the class, don't worry. You get a free replay. So no matter what, you get to watch the whole class. You get to learn how to assess your body, and you get to learn how to prime your body. Again, it's mapsprimewebinar.com. It's free. Make sure you go there, and it'll help you out. Also, this episode is brought to you by Legion, one of our favorite performance-enhancing supplement companies. They make amazing supplements like protein powders, pre-workout supplements. Uh, they have a creatine supplement, which is excellent, one of my favorite creatine supplements I've ever taken. Now, we work with Legion because they're very transparent. If, when you look at the label, it tells you exactly how much of each ingredient is in the product. They have third-party testing, and they only use efficacious doses. So that means if you're taking a pre-workout and there's beta alanine in there to help you with stamina and strength, the dose of beta alanine that's in there is the one that's been shown in clinical studies to be effective. Many supplements will have the ingredient that you think is going to work for you, but they put it at such low doses, they pixie dust it in there and you get no benefit. Legion doesn't do that at all. Uh, they have one of their most popular supplements is their pre-workout supplement and it comes with caffeine or without caffeine. So you can actually get it stimulant free. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, because you listen to Mind Pump, you get a discount on any Legion supplement. Here's what you do. Go to buylegion.com. That's B-U-Y-L-E-G-I-O-N.com forward slash Mind Pump. If you're a new Legion customer, you'll get 20% off your entire order. If you're a returning Legion customer and you use our discount code, you'll get double rewards points. Uh, so go make sure you check that out. Also, all month long, MAPS Starter, our wonderful at-home physio ball dumbbell-based workout for the whole body is 50% off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapsstarter.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com and use the code STARTER50. That's S-T-A-R-T-E-R-5-0, -E no space, for the discount. Let's talk about one of the most frustrating aspects of, uh, of working out. Easily for me, the most frustrating, and it's got to be for a lot of people. And it's, you know, when you when you talk to people who work out consistently and put in hard work and effort, this is like the worst possible thing. And it's the stubborn body part. Mm. It's the body part that it, like it just doesn't seem to... Just doesn't respond, doesn't grow, doesn't do what you want it and, to do. And everybody, doesn't listen. Everybody's got one unless you're that genetic freak who was blessed to be, you know, that was born to be a bodybuilder. It's super common. Like yeah. every person has that one body part, right? Where yeah. that just doesn't... Yeah. Now, you know, people might, you know, what is a stubborn body part? Well, it's really in relation to the rest of your body because if your whole body's stubborn, you don't have a stubborn body part. You're just not... <laughs> everything stubborn. matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything matches. Stubborn body parts are the ones that, for whatever reason, they just don't seem to respond with the same level of speed or enthusiasm or just responsiveness as the rest of your body, which actually makes it far more, uh, in my opinion, 
frustrating because it's like you're working out and you know let's say your glutes don't are, are stubborn and your quads are responding hamstrings are responding your biceps your shoulders it, you know and your butt is just not like what is it asleep like what's going on is you know it not what there? i there's very few like can you think of um i like this conversation i'm glad we're going this way because it, it this should strike a chord with everybody totally. because as i'm like recalling all the people that we've trained I think I've seen a, a pretty even split of every body part. Like I've definitely had plenty of clients that couldn't get their butt to grow. I've had plenty mm -hmm. of clients that couldn't get their calves to grow. I've got plenty of clients that couldn't get their ch chest to respond. Mm -hmm. Plenty of clients that couldn't get their abs to respond. Like every muscle group I think I have seen, and it, I would say all of them are pretty damn common. Maybe shoulders would be one of the least, but even then I think I've seen that too. Like Yeah, that was Doug. Doug's, uh, Doug's mm. stubborn body part was delts. Uh, mm, for a long time. Really? So yeah, no, we have someone in the room who's had that one. Yeah. I, I've seen them all. You're a hundred percent. Now, personally for me, um, you know, I've had uh, shoulders at one point was mm -hmm. a stubborn body part. Um, my calves were stubborn, uh, still are. Um, chest, that's my nemesis. It's still, I would consider a stubborn body part, but I've gotten it to go very, very far from where I was. So I personally have dealt with this, you know, myself. Now, it, it, here's the interesting part though, is that we're saying that we're, and we're claiming that, and I'm, I agree with you because my chest was that at one point I would even thought my, my shoulders, my calves. So, but more often than not, it's not stubborn. Mm. It's not stubborn that it's, it's it like, that's not something intrinsically wrong. Right. Exactly. Right. right there's, right. there's, there's things that need to be addressed and that's so I, we should definitely dive into that yes, because yes. One of the things that all the muscle groups that I thought were so stubborn on myself, there was there was a, there was a missing component or something that I wasn't doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad you went there because there are definitely genetic factors that can uh, make some body parts uh, appear to respond better or to look more stand out. That's definitely true. So I don't want to uh, I don't want to discredit that. I don't want to you know m you know in invalidate that particular factor. But the fact is that the genetic components, which I'll go over, the genetic components are things you can't control. So it's kind of a waste of time to focus on them anyway. So what's one genetic component? Well, the length of what's called the length of the muscle belly may be one, right? So if you have, so if you, when you look at a muscle and you go from tendon to tendon, right? So look at your bicep. It goes muscle belly. This is where all the muscle fibers are. That's the bulk of the muscle. Then it goes into connective tissue and then tendon. The muscle belly itself can genetically be longer or shorter. Or shorter. Mm -hmm. So if you look at someone, if you look at a bicep, yeah. if the belly itself is really short versus really long, and you build them both, the longer belly just has more visual potential for growth. It's like calves. Like you ever see somebody with mm. really really high calves? Right. They like could, softballs that are up there. Yeah, they could develop them, but they're not going to be like Justin's calves that go down to his heel. You know, he's yeah, got these really go long all the way down. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're very long calves, so there's a lot of potential. Now that's a genetic factor, so I'm not taking away from that. You just can't control that. There's nothing you can control about that. That it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Besides that, uh, what Adam's saying is 100 percent true. Nine out of ten times. That's not the main reason why the muscle, that particular muscle isn't responding. The main reason has to do more with what you're doing or not doing, mm -hmm. and that's why it's not you know, responding. You and have I, to do a little detective work to find out you know, what the missing link is. There. Yes. There's a, there's a few favorite things that I would hear from a potential client. Um, and as a trainer, you'll hear your client, you know, potential client, tell you what they want to work on, what their challenges are because you're doing your assessment. And there's a few words that and phrases that are, you know, what I would call like money phrases. And what I mean by that is you'd hear it and you'd know right away, I can show that person value in that. Like I'm going to show them what I can do. Mm -hmm. One of them is pain. You know, my shoulder hurts, my hip hurts, my knee hurts. Uh, and if it's not an acute injury, I knew right away, oh, they're going to love me after about a month or two because I'm going to take away some of their pain. And that's just so valuable, right? Mm -hmm. The other one was... Uh, a stubborn body part. Yeah. That, that was one of my favorites. Like, you know, if I met somebody who's been working out, which is less common than people who don't work out, but there were, you know, a decent chunk of people who were working out who would come hire me and they would say to me, you know, and I'd ask them, you know, well, what are your main goals with personal training? And they said, well, I work out all the time and my upper body is very developed and my legs just don't respond or my arms are just really stubborn or I can't get my back 
to really respond. I used to love that. It was it was like it was a money phrase because I knew that there was something that I could do with them that would make that body part respond and then they would see the value in my training. Mm-hmm. I, I vividly remember when this came together for me. I had just finished up my uh, corrective exercise specialist certification. And so I was uh, early to mid 20s and um, really understood on a much deeper level than the surface level I understood uh, lower cross syndrome. So you know, when you go through some of your basic certs, you get kind of a, a breakdown and you, you start to piece that together. When I really understood what was going on and that so, so many people suffered from that and why that also results in them being very quad dominant and not being able to develop their glutes and then mm-hmm. what I needed to do to correct that and fix that, it, it was a, it was a definitely, there was a huge explosion in my business at that time in my, in my career because mm-hmm. I became this butt guy. I became the guy who could help you start to grow. Yeah, it was a big yeah. butt. It was a butt yeah. guy for sure. Yeah, the bumper uh, sticker. Because it, I mean, that's a common one, right? You you think of uh, I mean, there's I think at one point I've seen them all, but uh, as far as pain points, uh, ass is a big one, especially for somebody who uh, trains mm-hmm. legs all the time or try just tries to train their butt totally, and and they get these incredible quads, but then they're just their ass is flat and they can't seem to get the butt to grow. That's extremely frustrating for somebody who's putting all the work in the gym, especially when they think they're doing all the exercises and doing the things they're supposed to. That yes. was the most common one for me and, and all my clients that would come in uh, in terms of like where they were not responding. That that was like a, such a common thing because, again, yeah, it, it's where it's set up, like the alignment and, and the way that, uh, you know, their posture was stacked and everything. Uh, I mean, it, it just wasn't even there for them to to recruit properly their, their, uh, their glutes. Yeah. And so that was just such an unlocking thing for me to be able to show them. Yeah. So uh, think about it this way. The most effective exercises you could do for your body are typically compound movements. These are exercises where you're using more than one joint. And this is widely understood. They're just very effective. Now, your muscles work together like a team to have you perform a particular action, okay? This means that sometimes some muscles will do more work than other muscles. And so this is just what ends up happening. So you could do exercises that are supposed to be the best for your glutes or your chest or your back, but because of the way your body moves, you develop other muscles that you maybe are... are, And so oftentimes, people with like a butt that doesn't respond oftentimes have great quads. You know what I'm saying? Somebody whose chest doesn't grow often has great shoulders yep. and triceps. Somebody whose back doesn't respond oftentimes has great biceps because they tend to work together with pulling movements. And the other ones I talked about were mm-hmm. pushing movements. There's another myth that I do want to dispel, though, along these lines. And this is a little bit more uh, going into the weeds a little bit, so bear with me. But there's a myth that that still floats around there that muscle fiber uh, ratios in the body mm. really determine if muscles respond more than others. Now, there are two, gen- this is very generalized, it's a little more complex than this, but there's two general types of muscle fibers. When you go into a muscle, the little you know strings or whatever are considered muscle fibers. And generally speaking, you can break them up into two general categories. One is fast twitch. Fast twitch burns energy very quickly, burns out very fast, but generates a lot of power. Mm-hmm. Slow twitch is the opposite. It doesn't burn a lot of energy very quickly. It's got a lot of staying power, but it's got way less power. Fast twitch muscle fibers, because their job is to generate power, getting bigger becomes very beneficial. Mm -hmm. They grow because a bigger fiber contracts harder. Burns faster energy, but it contracts harder. Less uh, blood supply. Right. A slow slow twitch muscle fiber, because its, its goal is to give you more stamina, more staying power, it resists growing because a bigger muscle fiber just burns more energy and it wants to stay efficient. This is why sprinters who use power but burn out very quickly have bigger muscles than long distance runners who use the efficient, long lasting, slow twitch muscle fibers. Okay, so it makes sense that genetically you may be born with a a propensity for more fast twitch muscle fibers, more slow twitch muscle fibers. That'll dictate to an extent how much muscle you can build. Mm. And then what people have done is they've taken that too far and said, oh, your, your, the rest of your body grows great because you have all these fast switch muscle fibers. That one sm- muscle group that doesn't develop well, your biceps, it's because you have too many slow twitch muscle fibers. doesn't work that way. Your muscle, although some muscles generally have more slow twitch and others have more fast twitch, generally speaking, your whole body tends to match. You wouldn't have sprinter genes for your entire body except for your quads yeah. or your whole body except for your biceps. So that's a myth. The myth, That's a genetic myth that that's 
one of the main reasons. Besides muscle belly length, like I talked about before, the only things that tend to be the reason that this muscle group isn't responding has to do with things that you're either doing or not doing. And I think we should probably, uh, you know, well, get into those. I, I like narrowing it down to like what we think are like the the four key because when I was going through that the uh, corrective exercise specialist certification, and I learned about lower cross syndrome, and I began helping people with the, develop their glutes. It also the light switch went off for me because at that time, still in my career, I was struggling with my chest. And it's what you'll start to find is even though a chest and butt are completely different. The, the, the reasons why my chest wasn't developing is very similar to the same reasons why my clients' glutes weren't developing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when that, when that light bulb went off for me on how I could help them fix that, it completely changed the, my approach on how I trained and developed my chest. And mm -hmm. the, first, the first one that I think of right away is just is a, is a poor connection. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not firing. You gave a great analogy. What what you see sometimes, somebody who can't develop their chest. Well, then that same person a lot of times has great anterior delts and or triceps, mm -hmm. and that's because those muscles are taking over a movement that should be chest dominant. Just like the person who doesn't ha that has the flat butt but has great quads, their quads are taking over the movement instead of their glutes. So even though we could talk about all different muscles. A lot of the, the common the common themes are the four main ones that we're going to nail down to will will generally help you in on no matter what muscle chest group. and butt do have cleavage though that's right? true so they do, do they do have something in common yeah. have you guys ever seen I'm sure you haven't but I'll ask anyway have you ever seen a like a professional arm wrestler do a pull up you ever seen this mm -mm. no so they do lots of pull ups right uh, arm wrestlers need very strong biceps mm -hmm. they need to pull very hard in fact certain positions in arm wrestling uh, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a nerd with arm wrestling. Uh, in, involves what are called pullers. It's a technique that you use. And so they do pull-ups to strengthen that that pulling movement. But if you watch them do pull-ups... I don't even have to. I could tell you I know how they do them. Yeah, it's 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 an arm pull-up. Yeah. Yeah. Their, their back is is supporting them, but they're not doing lat pull-ups. Didn't, not we, didn't we do a YouTube video for pull-ups for biceps and we and we taught this? I think we might have. I, think uh, but that's might a, have. I love that you're going here. I wasn't even thinking this direction, but... You know, this is also how you can take a one exercise and make it for a total different muscle. Absolutely. So yeah. if you watch these arm wrestlers do pull-ups, you'll notice rounded shoulders. It's mostly biceps and forearm. The back is there as a supporting role, but the biceps and arms are doing most of the work. And of course, you look at arm wrestlers, very developed arms, and their backs tend to not match their arms. Now, pull-ups are known to be a back exercise. If you'd see a pull-up in a routine, nine out of ten times, it's there because it's in back. People typically don't do pull-ups for their arms, although they can be done for arms. It's actually quite rare. So it's all about their connection and how they're doing the movement. And what ends up happening over time is if you're doing an exercise, and I'm going to put in quotations my marks wrong, in other words, you're doing an exercise and you think you're trying to work one muscle, but in reality you're working with the supporting muscles, the more you do it the way that way, the better you get at doing it the wrong way. You actually strengthen Whatever you train is what you strengthen. In fact, a professional arm wrestler can probably do more pull-ups the wrong way than they could the right way because they've trained it that way for so long. Mm -hmm. And that's where the poor connection comes from. So if you see somebody whose glutes tend to not be developed and you watch them do a barbell squat or a deadlift, you're going to see more hamstrings in the deadlift and more quads in the squat right. because they're squatting in a, the way that they're squatting is working other muscles more and other mu muscles less. And the more you do this, and this is why it's so hard, because when you're working with a beginner, all their body parts are stubborn. And I can start from scratch and I can teach you. Yeah. You guys ever hear uh, uh, martial artists say it's easier to teach a beginner than it is to teach an expert in another martial art? Yeah. Like if you're a, a Thai boxer and you got a Taekwondo black belt coming in, really hard to teach them how to do a, a, a Thai kick. Oh, yeah. It's the same in music. I mean, like going going in and, and trying to teach somebody that has already solidified the way that they say it's piano, the way that they play the keys and they hold their hands up and all these. They've mastered their their specific way of of uh, approaching this, and then trying to you have to unlearn all those the the way that you've you've gone about it forever. Exactly. Golf, golfers will tell you the same thing. Mm. You know, if you go in and you just start hitting a golf ball and you start to develop a pattern on how you do the swing, and you do that for a year, two, three years. And then all of a sudden you decide you really want to get serious about golfing and then you have and you hire a professional and they just tear you apart. 
And it sucks because you'll end up regressing at the beginning because mm -hmm. you've got to strip that person back down and get rid of all the bad habits, even though they may have seen a little bit of success this way. And so the same thing goes with training. Mm -hmm. I mean, how often have you got somebody who was like somebody who loved to run, right? Mm -hmm. Runners, sprinters, or long distance runners, and then now they want to develop their butt. Mm -hmm. They're so used to running on their quads yep. and training that way. And the, so, and your body, the way your body works, right? It doesn't, it doesn't go, oh, this is a chest exercise and it just automatically works the chest because it's supposed to be your chest. It's going to take the easiest path always. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so if it's gonna you- say press, move bar this way. Exactly, That's move it. bar that way. That's how the brain operates. It sees that and it will default to what you are strong in. If you are somebody who has a chest that doesn't respond very well, but you're, you're, you've been bench pressing for a long time, right? One of the best exercises for chest. And let's say your max bench press is 250 pounds, okay? If I get you to activate your chest early on, if I change your form, you ain't going to be able to bench 250. You're going to be weaker mm -hmm. because you're going to get you're strong at the way you've been practicing. Yep. This is why it can be so difficult. So I'm glad we're going here because the rule number one with a poor connection is to take 15 steps backwards. Yep. If you're doing pull-ups and your biceps are responding and your back isn't, rather than doing you know 15 pull-ups, you're doing three and your form is totally different. If you're bench pressing with 175 pounds and your chest isn't responding, we're going down to 115 pounds yeah. and we're and you're changing your technique and really focusing on feeling the chest. It's going to feel like an entirely new exercise. It is. It, so it's this is like a new skill you're developing. You have to approach it like I have to do this a completely different way. So yeah, you do have to acknowledge you're going to regress. You're going to start again from and, scratch. And since we're talking right now to people with stubborn body parts, which is assuming that you already work out, you've already revealed to yourself that you have a stubborn body part, this is very important. Got to take a bunch of steps back, identify how to get that muscle to connect. So in a bench press, what does the chest do? The chest brings the elbow to the center line of the body. That's what the chest does. So I got to change my technique. I got to focus on that. That means I'm going to have to bench press with like 70% or 60% or less of the weight that I'm used to. When you're doing a squat, what do the glutes do? Well, the glutes take your leg from in front of you and bring it to straighten your body out. They don't extend the knee. That's your quads. So I'm going to have to learn how to sit back a little bit differently, how to activate the glutes. That means I'm mm -hmm. probably going to have to squat at like 50% weight and relearn. We are trying to reconnect. By the way, before you can develop a muscle, you have to connect to the muscle very well. It's not going to work. It doesn't work any well, way. Well, it's a little more nuanced than that too. Like you just you just glazed right over two things that are important, I think, to know because there's some people that understand what how the chest works. Like, okay, yeah, move the elbow to the center line. But if you do that with a forward shoulder, you're still going to yeah, get all yeah. dealt. Right. So you not only that, you have to learn to prime the body to be able to get the muscles that hold the shoulder girdle back in place while you also move that. So there, it's a little more nuanced. And the same thing goes for what you're talking about with the uh, developing your glutes. If you squat and you end up putting all your weight on your quads and you don't know how to move your hips properly, right. yeah. then you're still, even though your, your squat may look like it's a good squat, if it's not activating your glutes because you're quad dominant, there's more things going on than just actually performing the yeah, exercise. Yeah, I used to tell my my clients, like, first we got to learn how to anchor the movement. And so, like, anchoring the movement, just like you said, with the shoulder blades, uh, bringing it back and being able to really provide stability first. Where are you going to provide stability? How are you going to hold your ground before even performing the movement? That's a vital part of that process, which then allows you to, to get the full access and full recruitment of your chest. Yeah, nine out of ten times when someone has a weak body part and, you ask, and then you ask them, so they say, oh, my chest isn't developed. And you say, do you feel your chest when you bench press? No. It's part, they know part of it's like, I don't, I do squats all the time. I just don't feel my butt. My quads get sore and I feel it in my quads. And this is okay. This is the real value of proper priming. I'm glad you said that, Adam, because if you prime properly, you can learn how to feel what you're supposed to feel because it's really, I'm going to say this right now, unless you're very, very experienced with training, you know, the nuances that we're talking about, you have to understand how to feel the muscle before you can feel it in the exercise, just knowing form and technique although very helpful, still can make it very difficult. I could tell somebody all day long who doesn't feel their glutes when they squat, here's what the glutes do, here's what the form should look like. They're still going to have a tough time until they know what it feels like and then know what to search for. That's the part that makes a big difference, and priming does that. That's yeah. I'm so excited that Justin is running this webinar right now because this. if you're listening right now 
and maybe you thought that this this free webinar is not something that you need to listen to, but then this this is resonating with you that oh my god, I have a studying st stubborn body part. You need to take that webinar. You mm -hmm. need to go through that because more likely than not, this is part of the reason why. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to go through there and show you the the importance of these these three core movements and then how to address it if you can't do it properly. And getting to that place is so important before you build on it or start to address the stuff. Yeah, removal. proper priming is like uh, it's like the, the 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 magic wand for a stubborn body part. It really, really is because the biggest. I mean, we started with poor connection. But poor connection is the main reason why people yeah. have. But there's other reasons, which I, I want to get into also. Uh, I think the next one, this one is also relatively common. And it has, this one I see more often in men than women, mainly because we tend to ego lift a little bit more, mm. which is just a, a, a lack of range of motion, a lack of full range of motion. And it mm. tends to be because... Guys want to go a little too heavy. Well, I would say that, and then also if there was ever any previous like pain or of, like an injury or something sure. that like had followed you forever, <laughs> and you've been uncertain as far as like how far to go with with the range of motion, and then just just doing that and repeating that uh, range of motion, your body gets really familiar and comfortable with that. So it's hard to then uh, really you, you know press yourself a little further beyond that. Oh yeah, I remember w one when I was younger, my back I just couldn't feel. It's a hard one. Your back muscles, especially when you first start working out, it's hard to feel, hard to connect. It's it's behind you, you know. I don't know what that's supposed to feel like or whatever. And so at, at one point, you know, I, I considered my back like, uh, maybe it's stubborn or not sure what's going on. And so what I did was uh, part of what I did. Besides, I did supersets that helped a lot. I finally felt a little bit of a pump. But the other thing I did was when I would do a pull down or a pull up, is I went all the way down to the stretch and went all the way up to the squeeze. I connected to the whole range of motion because up until that point, you know, I was a kid working out and I just wanted to see how many more reps I could do mm -hmm. or how much more weight I can use. And the truth is, of course, you can lift more weight when you don't when you do a shorter range of motion. I can half squat way more than I can full squat and I could do a way more pull-ups if I don't go all the way down to a stretch and go all the way up to where I get my chest to touch the bar and really squeeze. So that range of motion really does contribute to the first one we, ta we talked about, which mm -hmm. was poor connection. Another one is the myth of tension. Now, I blame bodybuilders for this. Bodybuilders, you got to understand something. When a, when a, when a high-level bodybuilder is communicating something to the average person, what they're often communicating is a technique that works for them at that point in their development. They're already jacked. They're already huge. They've been training for years. They've got crazy genetics. They might be on anabolic steroids. They've got great connection to muscles. They, they, the bodybuilders know how to connect to muscles. And so they'll say something like, when I do a shoulder press, I don't lock out so I can keep tension on the shoulders. Or when I do a, you know, a squat, I don't go all the way up because I'm trying to keep tension on my quads. Now, this is a bit of a myth because the truth is you can keep tension on a muscle through stretch all the way up to lockout because it's intrinsic. Tension is an intrinsic thing. Now, you can change your form to force you to have tension, but that's cheap. That's not nearly as effective as being able to connect to, your, to the movement yourself. So if I'm doing like a shoulder press, I'm better off going all the way up to lockout, but not resting the weight on my joints, but rather going all the way up and squeezing my shoulders, tensing my arms, and maintaining that connection. That full range of motion, and we know this. Studies confirm this. Uh, very, very well. They do show that for overall muscle development, longer ranges of motion are superior to shorter ranges of motion. This is one of the number one cardinal rules of, especially when you train people, is to teach them how to do that. Wasn't it Wasn't it our good buddy uh, Ben Pakulski, the one that made the case for that he's like the number one thing for him, he says, is that the in squeeze. The, yeah, the squeeze in the fully contracted position. That because he, it's poor connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like think about this. If you have a client whose glutes don't grow, how hard is it for them to squeeze it in the full, fully contracted position? Right. Yeah. It's hard for them to just feel yeah, it there. And, and so people understand what you're referring to or what you're saying right there is that it's easy to feel a, a muscle to feel a muscle in its stretched position because yeah. gravity is doing it for right, you. Right. Think, think about being in an open position holding a dumbbell for a bicep, right? Right. Because it's stretched out, you don't even got to think about it. You feel it pulling mm -hmm. on the bicep. But bring the arm all the way to to your chest, or bring it all the way up, and you have to kind of intrinsically squeeze think it. about squeezing it because mm -hmm. you don't have gravity resisting it in its stretched position. This is why I like isometrics too, <clears throat> just because like it, 
if you're focusing on this range of motion and you don't have that connection, you don't feel it, uh, we can stay there a bit longer and really try and reinforce that process of how to recruit and how to generate, uh, you, you know, that, that, that connection again. And to be able to feel it is so important for you then to move forward and to be able to feel like you're, you got the strength and support you need uh, throughout that range of yeah, motion. Yeah, so when I would train clients and they had a stubborn body part, I would focus a lot on the squeeze, always on the squeeze. Okay, we're at the top. Squeeze. Squeeze your glutes. Yeah. Okay, you're at the top of your bench. And hold it for a bit longer. Even. Squeeze your chest. Connect to the chest. Oh, your shoulders. Squeeze at the top. You know that that squeeze because that leads back to poor connection and the and the lack of range of motion contributes to the poor connection. Well, this is why I like what Justin just said because uh, this is where uh, isometric training really kicked in for me because I, I realized that. Uh, and I used to tell clients this all the time, like resistance training, all it is, is flexion of the muscles yeah. with, with resistance. That's mm -hmm. all it is. That's all it. you are doing is flexing the muscle. So the better you are at flexing this stubborn body part, the mm -hmm. better you will be at developing it. And so, and one of the harder places to actually flex a muscle is in an isometric position because yeah. there is no movement. There is no gravity helping you out. Mm -hmm. There is no stretch position. You really have to learn to intrinsically do that. And so if you train that really well, then when you add resistance, you add weight, it's e easier to make that connection. So this is another really great value in isometric training, another one of those lost arts that not enough people it, do. It is. And what helps you gain connection to ranges of motion? Priming. Again, if you prime your body properly, now, so if I'm going into a bench press and my chest is a weak body part, the hardest part for me to feel my chest is going to be at the top of the bench press. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it is. It's just the hardest. How do I feel, you know, my chest squeezing at the top of the press? It's not a, even a full squeeze. Like what is, but if I prime beforehand and I can identify the squeeze and here's an easy, simple way to, to prime your chest. Now this isn't priming a movement pattern issue, which is far more common so uh, what I'm about to give you is decent advice for somebody who's got good movement. I would grab a stick and I would just grab just it and, start and just drive inward yeah. with my chest like I'm trying to slide my hands together but don't actually do that and squeeze my chest. Identify the feeling. So that's a form of priming. Then I'd go bench press. Now I know what to feel as I'm squeezing through. Now, as I said, for most people, it's more to do with lack of connection to the stabilizing shoulder blades and to other parts. But priming <laughs> helps so much with extending connected ranges of motion. So that's why, again, it's so valuable at bringing up stubborn body part. Now, the next one that I think of is what made me realize that maybe I don't have as many stubborn body parts. I just, <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm not prioritizing. Yeah. And the, yeah, I, I shared this story <clears throat> about, I did, I did a YouTube video, I think a couple of months ago uh, about uh, my shoulders and uh, I had really, really terrible shoulders and it was brought to my attention by, uh, a female trainer of mine that was working for me at the time and she was a bodybuilder and I had her uh, assess my physique and like, you know, tell me what I could be working on. You know, you're, you're professional in this. Like, what are you thinking? Oh, she told me, Adam, you have very weak shoulders, you know, and that like just, <gasps> dude, I just destroyed my ego. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the truth is at that time in my career, I, uh, I, this is how I trained my shoulders. I thought, okay, they were kind of an afterthought. It was, well, every time I do heavy chest, I get some anterior delts. Every time I go heavy back, I get some rear delt. Okay, I'll throw some lateral stuff in there. And then I'm done. And then I'm done. Yeah. So it was just that I was, of course, I was getting my shoulder. My shoulder and it, there's some truth to that because you, when you do your chest, you can't not use your shoulders. Mm -hmm. They're involved. Sure. Same thing when you do your back. So your rear delts are involved. So, you know, my theory was they're getting plenty of attention and uh, they why aren't they developed that way? And then she really picked on me. And then she said, listen, she said, why don't you start every week, every time you, you start a week off, you start with that area, start with your shoulders. And that was the first time I ever started like designating a workout for my shoulders. And I began to say, okay, if this is a weak body part, you know, because this happens to everybody. I don't care who you are. Maybe if you're some, you know, crazy, uh, you know, bodybuilder guy who that's all you do is live in the gym. Most people have you know, ebb and flow of training. You, you're really consistent for a while and you're a little less consistent, maybe even fall off for a week or two or even months sometimes at a time. And what the natural thing for you to do when you come back is to always gravitate towards the stuff you like yeah. to train. I mean, we all have favorite exercises and body list. parts. Yeah, yeah, the stuff you like or you're good at. And the truth is, if you're really trying to develop a very symmetrical physique or work on a, a body part that is underdeveloped, then making it the priority always. And this was something that I first started with my shoulders and then it ended up being my legs next that I started to think this way. I just, I just made a, a pact with myself that, okay, 
One, I'm gonna it's gonna start my week always off like that. And no matter where I end in my workout routine where I fall off for a little bit, when I come back, I'm always starting with the the weak muscle group. Mm-hmm. So I could have, let's just say I've been on a, a kick for three months and I just had an awesome shoulder workout, something happens in my life. And, you know, I I fall off for a week or two and then I come back to the gym. Well, I did shoulders last. So maybe I should do something. No, I'm going to go right back to shoulders Mm -hmm. again. I'm starting again that week. So prioritizing was huge for me. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is a, this is actually quite common. I mean, I, you know, a a majority of times when somebody has a body part that's weak, especially if it's for men, legs and calves and for women, arms and shoulders, typically I'm generalizing, but this is typical. Typically it's because athletes, it's biceps. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to say that. Typically it's because they don't place as much prioritization or focus on them. If you really look at their routines, you know, oh, my calves don't respond. I'm guilty of this. Ah, my calves don't respond. I said it earlier in this episode. The truth is, what's the body part I've done the least amount of sets, the least amount of exercises, and what's the body part I never start a workout with? Yeah. Calves, right? right? So prioritization literally means you prioritize it. It's the first body part. That, by the way, studies show this. If you train full body, the body part or exercises you start with tend to get more of the gains. That's why you always want to start with the big compound lifts. But if you have a body part that's weak, you really want to focus on, start your workout that way. Never skip that body part that you need to train because that's a big one. Prioritize it. Make it a priority. Focus on it. And that makes a big difference. I love that you brought that up because this was a question I know we've gotten a lot with with people is because we, we've set up the programs uh, general to try and help the majority but we always have encouraged people to modify. Of course. And so if let's say you're following MAPS Anabolic, <clears throat> of course we're going to start with the big compound list that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck and that makes the most sense for overall muscle gain and fat loss for anybody. But if that same person is like a major goal of theirs is to develop calves while they also do this program, that is an exception where I'd say, listen, for now on, start your MAPS anabolic with the calves in the front. Totally. If mm-hmm. you think you already have good quads and a great bud and it's not like a major focus yours, just by you simply addressing your calves first in the routine always mm-hmm. will already make a huge impact. So prioritization was uh, a huge uh, game changer for me when when that light bulb yeah. finally went off. Now, th- this this one I actually, and it be- mainly because it was a body part I really, really liked to train and I really wanted to develop. When I first started working out, Shoulders were a body part that I was insecure about. I'm narrow naturally. I was kind of bony. I don't like the way I looked in t-shirts. And I would follow my workout and I'd start to develop. My arms developed very quickly, but my shoulders kind of lacked. And so what I did is I just did more exercises, more sets, and trained my shoulders more frequently. So I'd be out in the backyard doing laterals and presses and mm-hmm. rear laterals. And, and and you know what happened over time? It took time, but over time, my shoulders became a strong suit. In fact, it's one of my better body parts. But people don't know this. It started out being a weak body part, but I had to prioritize it. This one takes a lot of self-reflection because I have trained many times a dude that comes to me and goes, my legs just don't grow. And what's the first body part they skip when they skip a workout? Legs. It doesn't just magically happen. Yes, yes. You have to prioritize. Prioritize it. All right, the last one is probably, uh, I'd say the least uh, communicated in terms of which ones have the most impact, Mm. although it's still relatively common, which is just you have bad workout programming. Yeah. You know, now this one, I hate to say it, is much more common in women and especially with people who want to develop a butt. Now, the reason why it's more common in women is because women are advertised crappy workouts more than men are. It's just a fact. If a workout is advertised to a woman, it typically tends to be like, don't do these exercises over here because they build bulk. Right. Do these these Pilates-based exercises. They produce long, lean muscles. And do these right. short, choppy exercises right. for your glutes because you feel the burn. And use this hip circle because forget dumbbells and barbells and whatever because they're not, they'll make you look bulky. And it, and you look at their work. I'm like, why doesn't my butt grow? And I look at their well, routine. It's like yeah, it, dog pees, butt kicks. Like, oh, okay. It, I know it, why. it goes back to what you kind of brought up earlier about fast twitch, slow twitch uh, muscle fibers and like the difference between the two. And like you have to train your body uh, completely different for both of those objectives and uh, that's something that, again, like with women, that it's a very common that that's neglected and it's not advertised very often when, in fact, that's something that could stimulate such a massive difference for them and, and get like the kind of results they're looking for just by, you know, altering the amount of, of reps, uh, the, the rest periods, like mm-hmm. things like that, that's going to have a dramatic difference on the way that you're shaping the muscle now and getting more explosive response out of the muscle, which t- 
tells it to grow in a different way. I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge that a little bit. I I, I think guys are just up there too. And and what I think about right away that comes to mind was the way uh, uh, Eugene Tao and I uh, got connected. Was he, mm. he he did a post uh, that was you know kind of encouraging uh, the benefits of the hack squad and and you know telling telling people that they don't, they don't have to squad. Mm. It's not a mandatory movement. And uh, we we had great dialogue. I challenged that way of thinking. And the reason why I did is from my experience with so many male clients that, you know, trained legs, but it was leg extensions, leg curls, yeah. leg press. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and then true. complain that their their legs wouldn't, wouldn't develop or that's, wouldn't look. And, and I'm guilty of this too. I mean, I ever, when I was younger, when I would squat, my low back would bother me. And so I did all the alternative exercises and all the machines for my legs and then, mm-hmm. you know, bitched about why I didn't have great legs. Mm-hmm. And it was a it was a lack of prioritization, but it was also a lack of good programming. Mm-hmm. You know, once I once I learned the benefits of squatting and then when I learned how to deep squat, holy crap. I mean, I, I train my legs with less intensity, less volume today than what I was doing in my mid twenties, and they're way more developed mm-hmm. because of the exercise selection that I do now. I mean, you get if you just squat five to eight sets a week it is it for me at least i have found more value in that than 30 sets of leg press leg extension and leg curls that's true for most throughout the week yes yeah and and that was a hard thing for me to get through my own head and then it was a hard thing for me to communicate to a lot of my male clients and it's the reason why i challenged eugene when he posts that not because i thought he was wrong but because Man, I said I remember myself at 20 years old. That's all you needed is to read a post. Exactly, like that. Yeah, give me a and reason. Exactly, and if I if I was looking up to a guy like you, and you told me you gave me the the okay to not squat, I was that I I bought into that, and that's why I didn't because there were people at that time that were saying things like that that how amazing the leg compress could be and all these other machines how they're great for leg development. And nothing grew my legs more than learning how to squat. No, well. if you want to develop your body and you want to develop a weak body part, the routine needs to be centered around building muscle and building strength. And it needs to be a good muscle building uh, type routine. And if your program is not centered around that, um, then it's bad programming. You're not going to bring up a weak body part with a routine that's centered around shaping and small movements and yoga inspired and Pilates inspired and that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with that. Those have their own values, but they're not going to develop muscles nearly to the degree that you, that, that you, you know, that, that resistance strength, traditional resistance strain will. And they're definitely not going to bring up weak body parts as quickly. And what are some of the best exercises to develop your body parts? Free weight, barbell, dumbbell, compound movements. And if they're not included in your routine as the primary exercises, uh, you need to take a, a good look at your workout. And of course, sets and reps are your programs phased properly so you can go through different rep ranges. And of course, all the other stuff that we talked about. And I, and I also want to, you know, here's a, here's another uh, problem is, and it's, it's tough to get someone to break through this mentality is, you know, I, I feel it more when I do this exercise. Yeah. Mm. So like sometimes you'll get somebody who doesn't like to do like a bench press or a squat because the exercises that are like machines that are more isolating exercises, they feel it because it's easier for the filler. Right. That doesn't mean the exercise that you the, you don't feel it so much isn't more valuable. It means you're not doing it correctly. This is what priming does. Yes. Priming. Okay. So yes, you can feel the muscle more when you do a cable crossover than when you do a bench press. If you have a if your chest is a weak body part, that's true. So the value of the cable crossover is there, but the value is to prime you potentially for your bench press. That's where you get the value. This is the value of priming. You're not going to develop your stubborn body parts just by priming by itself. Of course not. The priming is what sets up all those awesome exercises I just talked about. Your barbell, dumbbell, free weight, compound movements. The priming sets you up so that those very powerful exercises now can give you what they can deliver, what their full potential can deliver. So that's the difference because I used to get that too with clients. Like, well, yeah. I know you're saying a, a you know a barbell squat works my is better for my butt growth, but I feel these you know these short dog pee exercises yes. more on my glutes. <laughs> and I'd say, well, okay, you feel them more. That's great. Why don't we use those to prime the glutes? Then do the barbell squats because by themselves they just don't send. Yeah, that's just the connection. That's not the work. That's right. That's right. You need the work to be able to change. And that's it. And look, check this out. Okay, we have a free class that's coming up. It's a webinar. It's online. It's unlimited. People can sign up. Doesn't cost anything. 
And Justin is literally going to take you through a self-assessment. The self-assessment is going to identify root causes, root movement reasons why you may have weak body parts. And once you identify those issues, those root issues, which he's actually going to coach you through, he's going to show you an exercise for each of them that will help prime your body, getting you to move better so that you can reap more value from I don't care what workout you're doing. You're not going to even – we don't even care if you change your workout at this point. Just prime properly and watch what happened. That class you can sign up at mapsprimewebinar.com. Do it now. By the way, when the classes are broadcast live, uh, Justin, Adam, myself, and Doug will be on there answering any questions. But if you miss the class, you get a free replay. So no matter what, you get to watch the entire class. Again, it's mapsprimewebinar.com.